their seats. I think we're ready to continue the uh, metal lectures. And the second in the series is Roland von Hune, Subduction Zone Concepts and the 2010 Chile Earthquake. And this is the Arthur Holmes Metal Lecture. So, Roland. Well, if you looked at the program, uh, you see that I've changed the title of this talk because uh, about uh, a month and a half after I submitted my uh, abstract and uh, my title, the February 27th uh, Chilean earthquake occurred, uh, a magnitude 8.8, .8, uh, second largest uh, recorded, uh, uh, well, in that area. And so, uh, I thought it would be more current to uh, uh, reconstruct this talk. And uh, I'm going to uh, start uh, uh, by uh, going back to uh, what I'd started originally and is in the abstract, and uh, then uh, go off and uh, try to uh, uh, explain some of the significance of the uh, Chilean earthquake and what we see there in the geology. So uh, the public attention is uh, a turn uh, to the havoc uh, that impacts society from great earthquakes and tsunamis, as we all know. And uh, the uh, increasing uh, devastation, uh, can, can these lights be dimmed, uh, please? Uh, the increasing devastation uh, makes it really important that the geoscience community continue and maybe accelerate uh, work on trying to anticipate these uh, large events uh, in a much shorter time frame uh, than is now possible. But uh, of course, this is problematic because the earthquakes occur at a depth that is uh, far beyond what our uh, capabilities in remote sensing uh, can uh, uh, resolve in terms of the, the smaller structures uh, that give you some kind of an idea uh, of what has occurred and what the processes and the mechanisms of uh, these earthquakes might be. And I also note that uh, many geoscientists uh, go to textbooks or something and they pick up what I will call a default model. And uh, this default model uh, is uh, it's not realized that uh, much of it is uh, really uh, conceptual and uh, not uh, very broadly based on observation. So uh, for a multidisciplinary audience, I thought I would go uh, through the evolution of thoughts about processes, uh, tectonic processes at uh, convergent margins uh, to show uh, how uh, We've sort of come from uh, this conceptual area where these older models uh, uh, were proposed to uh, much more uh, observationally based uh, models. And uh, uh, since this is a, the Arthur Holmes lecture, uh, I, uh, I'm going to start with the contributions that Arthur Holmes uh, uh, provided uh, for this topic and uh, uh, go through the evolution of thinking until uh, we get to the uh, uh, Chilean earthquake, and in the Chilean earthquake, uh, you'll see that there are some really significant things uh, that are learned because, in particular, the German work uh, in this area uh, has given us an unprecedented view uh, of uh, uh, earthquake, possible earthquake mechanisms and ways of uh, proceeding uh, with research. Uh, so. Uh, Arthur Holmes uh, revitalized the 1912 uh, uh, Alfred Wegener uh, continental drift uh, hypothesis by proposing in 1928 uh, that uh, it was uh, uh, the mechanism was mantle convection, and uh, the upwelling from uh, to uh, mantle convection would produce uh, uh, not only the ocean crust uh, that. Uh, new ocean crust, but also uh, things like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And it wasn't until 
about 20 years later uh, that uh, dated magnetic anomalies uh, that paralleled uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge uh, were shown to be uh, very young. Uh, but the real uh, compelling evidence came from the second leg of the Glomar Challenger. And uh, the first leg had been in the Gulf of Mexico to sort of work out the, the operations. So this was really the first uh, scientific drilling leg and it uh, made a transect across the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And by recovering sediment from just above the basement, uh, you had beautiful observational data that, of course, the, the ridge is very young and uh, toward the continents it gets uh, ever older. And so uh, this became an observable, uh, an observable that uh, uh, had other consequences because if you're going to generate ocean crust, then you also have to dispose of, a, of that crust in some fashion. And uh, by that time, we knew that there was a Benioff zone. But it was Arthur Holmes who uh, really uh, put the whole dynamics of the situation uh, into a, a model. And what he was trying to explain uh, was that uh, you had andesitic volcanism around uh, the Pacific, and uh, you form andesites by mixing uh, basalt with uh, either sediment or continental crust, some uh, more sialic uh, components. And what he uh, uh, proposed was that, uh, whoops, actually, uh, I have to find out where the pointer is here. Uh, actually, uh, pieces of continent were going uh, down the subduction zone, and he even proposed uh, that uh, maybe some sediment was caught up in this too. Uh, but what he didn't uh, 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 get to was uh, what happens uh, where uh, this convergent margin uh, first uh, becomes uh, a, a major tectonic feature. And, um, if you're uh, subducting ocean crust at the same rate at which it's uh, generated at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, uh, then you're bringing a lot of uh, ocean basin sediment to the margin, and most geoscientists uh, could just not accept that you could subduct soft uh, ocean basin sediment. So, of course, it, it had to be piled up against a margin. And at the time, uh, the tools that the marine geologists had uh, were certainly insufficient uh, to verify whether uh, that particular uh, process occurred. Uh, but that led to uh, the classical uh, uh, bulldozer model. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, this uh, uh, is, is a, an analogy that was, was easy to conceive of. And it was one that the uh, uh, geologists working in coastal ranges uh, really embraced because they were looking at enigmatic rocks and uh, it was difficult to explain uh, how they had originated and the bulldozer was, was just their model and so uh, they uh, enthusiastically uh, went around the globe and uh, they developed a, a whole variety of models that, uh, and this was uh, as you can see in the early 1970s. And um, all of these models were based on the bulldozer because uh, uh, what we called here uh, the, the imbricate fan uh, is uh, uh, the uh, major component of every one of the, the models, these six that you see here, and there are actually a lot more of them. And a, an extensive literature developed uh, in everyone sort of getting on the bandwagon with plate tectonics and uh, uh, showing uh, that uh, these rudimentary uh, seismic records that we had, which you could just interpret almost anyway, uh, were all interpreted in accord uh, with this imbricate fan model. So in uh, 1977, uh, the, the real test of this hypothesis began. And uh, every one of the pr proposals that went uh, to uh, the uh, people that decided whether you got a drilling leg or not 
were all based on uh, the imbricate fan model. And uh, invariably, uh, the, the objective was to recover the trench sediment uh, because, uh, as you can see, uh, in the imbricate model, uh, you take trench sediment and by tectonic thickening, uh, you bring it to higher and higher elevations. And uh, for instance, in, in this model here, uh, you would be able to actually uh, sample uh, trench sediment if you could get below uh, the covering sediment uh, at the edge of uh, the continental shelf. Well, uh, instead of uh, seeing uplift, uh, the drilling legs began to show that uh, the, there wasn't just uplift, but that there was subsidence, exactly the opposite. And the most compelling evidence there uh, was from the northern Japan margin. And uh, uh, here's one of... Uh, my colleague slides on this. Uh, the first leg that was really compelling was this northeast Japan uh, leg off Honshu. Uh, and uh, so let me uh, sort of take you uh, through some of that evidence uh, briefly, very briefly. And uh, over 20 years, uh, the drilling of convergent margins, about nine of them, only two of them remained uh, in any way uh, uh, interpreted uh, by a modified uh, imbricate fan model. And the last one uh, was in, in uh, Costa Rica in uh, 1996. Um, here we go, there's Costa Rica. And so I'll show you some details from uh, Japan uh, and from Costa Rica and throughout the talk, I'm gonna sort of stay with those two margins as examples. So, uh, this is a subsidence curve from northern Honshu. Uh, uh, the major evidence here uh, is a seafloor depth, and that seafloor depth is indicated by uh, foraminifera, the benthic foraminifera, those that live uh, on the ocean floor. And just like in a, if you stand in front of a mountain and you look at the vegetation, uh, there are zones of different vegetation as you go up in altitude. And exactly in this way, uh, you also have uh, foraminiferal assemblages that live on the ocean floor uh, that indicate a, a specific depth. And so you have certain depth zones. And by drilling uh, through uh, this kind of a section, uh, you can see that the oldest uh, 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 sediment are uh, just above basement, which is here. Uh, the oldest sediment uh, show a subsiding curve. Uh, these are unconformities uh, in here. And these big steps here are probably due to the fact that as you get very deep, the zonations have, are very broad. And if you then take the um, uh, depth of the sediment uh, at each one of the samples where you have a, a seafloor depth and add that to it, you can get a subsidence curve based on paleontology uh, for the basement. And here we are uh, about 22 million years later uh, with uh, a seafloor, or actually it was dry land, uh, that uh, has subsided now uh, to 3,000 meters. And the lithology was really consistent with this. And it was just beautiful because in that last core, well, we just got a few scraps of basement. Uh, we actually found scraps of soil. And uh, below the soil, uh, or above the soil, no, yeah, above the soil, there was this beautiful 100 meter section of sandstone. These were beach sands. And within these beach sands, you, you had still uh, the two halves of clam shells that were together. Uh, recovered uh, in, in the core. I mean, you were really lucky. But we also got many fragments of uh, megafossils. And none of them showed the kind of wear uh, that would occur if you were to transport these uh, from shelf depths down uh, to the, the base of the slope in a trench. And so uh, above those uh, were then shallower water sediments and uh, ever uh, a deepening uh, indicators of uh, uh, sediment deposition. So uh, you had a, a nice uh, solid paleontological record 
as well as a record uh, that uh, was consistent with the lithology. And <clears throat> one by one, after this leg, uh, uh, margins were drilled, beginning uh, with the hypothesis that they were uh, w w where would find uh, trench sediment at, at higher depths. But one by one, uh, in fact, uh, the number is about uh, uh, two out of nine uh, were still uh, somewhat uh, reasonably interpreted uh, with the uh, imbricate fan uh, type model. And uh, since uh, this is a, a, a surface of deposition, you can't erode the seafloor. And so the, the erosion had to be from uh, subsurface. And the, in the subsurface, uh, the, the best place to do any erosion, of course, is at the plate boundary in the subduction zone. Well, uh, this idea was so counterintuitive and so out of step with uh, an extensive literature uh, uh, that it, it was very slow to be uh, accepted. But the last, uh, I think, uh, uh, argument in, in, in this whole development came uh, when uh, the uh, Costa Rican margin was drilled. And in Costa Rica, uh, Paola Vanuki and her team uh, have done a beautiful job of doing the same kind of benthic paleontology, uh, showing uh, that there has been uh, a much more rapid uh, subsidence. Actually, uh, each of these curves uh, come from a different hole. Uh, they're quite consistent. And uh, you can see that in about six million years, you've gone from uh, shallow water down to uh, over three kilometers depth in addition to which there was a, a, a particular kind of rock that can only be formed in shallow water and, and surf zone uh, conditions. And uh, that rock was uh, found uh, at uh, four kilometers depth. Uh, now, another thing uh, that was counterintuitive, uh, but more easily accepted because it, it sort of came on very gradually, uh, was uh, that, uh, Oops, sediment can be subducted. And here we have uh, Nathan Bangs' uh, nice, nicely processed record. And what you see here as it's called the subduction channel is actually a, uh, a layer uh, 700 meters thick of uh, trench sediment uh, that continues on uh, beneath the uh, imbricate thrust zone. And note that it has a uh, almost co constant uh, thickness, which indicates that uh, something is controlling the amount of sediment that can be uh, accommodated in, in this uh, uh, subduction channel. And note also that when you have an excess, as you have here, with deep trench sediment, uh, the excess uh, becomes an accretionary prism, a frontal accretionary prism. And let me give you a scale from here to here is about 15 kilometers. So the first 15 kilometers of this is really an accreting margin, very much uh, in accord with the uh, uh, imbricate fan uh, kind of a model. Uh, but now if you uh, have a sediment uh, that is at about the same thickness as uh, the subduction zone can accept, then you can actually uh, subduct all of it. And here we have off Costa Rica about 700 kilometers of sediment. And as you can see, uh, it's going underneath uh, what is again a frontal prism. But the frontal prism here is not uh, really accreted because to be accreted, uh, you have to uh, transfer uh, sediment from the lower plate to the upper plate. Uh, to, so this was not an, uh, even though it had much the same structure as an accretionary uh, prism in the seismic records, it was made up of slope sediment. Uh, these are sediments then that have been repositioned uh, as they migrate down slope. And when they come in contact with this frontal prism area where you have uh, contractual uh, tectonics, uh, they get involved and produce the same kind of a prism and what these prisms do, 
is uh, they uh, raise the, the pore fluid pressures that are in the sediments that are being subducted. And once you raise the pore fluid pressures, you reduce friction. And so it's this reduced friction uh, that allows the sediment uh, to be subducted. So uh, by the end of the 90s, there was a pretty good consensus that there are three major processes uh, along convergent margins. Of course, uh, accretion, but uh, most of the accretion occurs in a, in a smaller frontal prism. It does have the uh, sort of an imbricate type of uh, 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 tectonic uh, structure. Uh, and uh, it, it occurs when you get excess sediment that cannot be admitted air and uh, that, that is beyond the capacity uh, of the sediment subduction. Uh, but when you don't have that excess, uh, then your margin can be erosional. And uh, instead of calling this an accretionary prism, uh, we call it a frontal prism so that it has no, connota uh, no uh, generic connotation. Uh, now, <clears throat> Uh, there are a couple of things that are, that are really uh, 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 interesting in this uh, simplistic kind of a diagram. And the first is that if uh, the uh, tectonic process of either accretion or erosion is uh, mainly controlled uh, by the amount of sediment that you have in the trench. And uh, if you have... Uh, the, an incoming sediment that exceeds uh, subduction zone capacity, then you can get accretion. But when you don't have that excess, then you either have non-accretion or erosion. And uh, interestingly, in the uh, just in, uh, in the last uh, couple of years, there's been uh, a reassessment of the uh, Franciscan formation, which was uh, one of the key uh, formations. Uh, that supported, uh, was used to support the uh, uh, imbricate fan hypothesis, and uh, they found with new age dating techniques uh, that f there's a 40 million year gap in the accretionary record of the Franciscan, meaning that uh, for 40 million years out of the less than 80 million years uh, of the development of the Franciscan formation, uh, you've had uh, either non-accretion or er er erosion. So you can see that uh, this process uh, can easily be go from one to the other, or maybe both of them occur at, uh, at uh, one part of a margin and the other at another uh, if you dam up uh, a, a trench. And I'll get back to this uh, when we get into the uh, Chilean earthquake. Uh, one of the uh, difficult things, though, uh, is to uh, study uh, the processes, uh, observationally study the processes of erosion. Uh, and uh, maybe a, a, a good tact here uh, is to take the largest features that will cause erosion uh, and, and begin to study them, even though they are perhaps unusual uh, in terms of uh, uh, what you normally see in subduction zones. And here off uh, uh, Central America, uh, we have uh, Costa Rica with the Nicoya Peninsula. Uh, San Jose is up in here, uh, and uh, here's the Osa Peninsula. Uh, and note that the, the trench uh, uh, is, is nice and straight here and then suddenly deviates uh, into the margin. And that happens exactly where you get these lines of seamounts. Now this is a satellite view, so uh, we're, we'll deal with the other topography in a little, just a minute. And uh, this, these seamounts are, are part of uh, Cocos Ridge, which uh, is generated at the Galapagos Islands. So you've got a, a great number of seamounts uh, on the seafloor, and you have to assume uh, that a lot of them have been uh, subducted. Now, uh, if you focus on, on this area here, which is a, a longer group of seamounts, and this little faint guy in here, then in, you see them again. Uh, the little faint guy is actually a duplex. 
uh, and that longer one is uh, this, uh, what we call the, the Capos Plateau. Uh, this is uh, the uh, Middle America Trench. Here you see uh, the topography that indicates uh, the frontal uh, uh, prism. Uh, in this case, we uh, haven't uh, sampled much in here. Uh, here's another example of the frontal prism, but what you see here is a beautiful sequence of uh, the subducting seamounts, uh, the first stage, a second stage, and here a third stage. And in the first stage, you can still see this nice bulge uh, where the seamount is, is going under. Uh, and uh, actually, the fracturing is quite radial on top of it. And uh, once it has gotten through the soft sediments of, 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 of the uh, frontal prism, uh, then it begins to plow into more consolidated and thicker rock, and so it tunnels in. And here you still see the bulge uh, above uh, the, the uh, subducting seamount. Uh, in the trailing flank, uh, you get all of these uh, uh, detrital sediments, uh, you get mass wasting, you get a bunch of debris, and it comes down here and suddenly it's, it's uh, been picked up again uh, in this later stage, and you've healed uh, your frontal prism in this case. This trace goes all the way to the edge of the shelf. And uh, if we now take a look uh, from uh, southeast to northwest, uh, looking uh, from the southeast, uh, you can see another view of what's happening here. The uh, our little doublet is here. Uh, here's Capos Plateau. Uh, here you can make out uh, the scars. Here is that long scar. And uh, in 1960, there was a 7 uh, magnitude 7 earthquake right in this area here, the Cabano earthquake, Cabano. Um, and uh, it, uh, uh, its signature, its rupture uh, was, was very localized. And the aftershocks made sort of a wreath around it. And uh, uh, the imaging uh, by tomography showed that uh, uh, this had occurred right above a seamount. So here we have an example of a seamount over which earthquakes are nucleated, or it becomes the asperity uh, for earthquakes. And that also occurred, uh, whoops, sorry. Uh, that also occurred um, where Capos Ridge comes in, and we can trace it along the, shell, uh, along the slope. And underneath the shelf in 1999, there was a 6-7, and uh, that earthquake left a trail of aftershocks that was elongate, uh, just like uh, the ridge uh, that you see uh, here exposed on the seafloor. So here again, we had evidence uh, that uh, ocean floor relief when subducted and when it, as it goes by the area of soft sediment and gets into the area where you can store elastic strain, uh, that it can become an asperity. But these seamounts can also become barriers to rupture. And in Japan, uh, you, you find uh, a beautiful example of this and Tony Watts has recently published a paper uh, where he shows this happening in, in various places. Uh, so uh, this ocean floor relief uh, can be either an asperity or uh, it can be a barrier to rupture. And uh, the Chilean earthquake uh, is a wonderful example, I think, of the barrier. Because let me uh, orient you here uh, with Valparaiso and Concepcion. Uh, the epicenter is uh, right here. Uh, beneath all of these aftershocks, about a month and a half of aftershocks over magnitude five, uh, you find uh, some coloring, and that coloring indicates the extent of the rupture during the initial earthquake. And so that rupturing, and the color goes all the way down here south of Concepcion to about this area, and it goes all the way up here uh, almost to uh, Valparaiso. What you see on the oceanic side are two major features. The Juan Fernandez Ridge uh, with O'Higgins Seamounts uh, in this area 
and uh, the Mocha fracture. Uh, and both of these project in uh, just about where uh, that uh, initial rupture uh, from the initial, uh, uh, initial earthquake uh, took place. Uh, now let's take a look at, at uh, the Juan Fernandez Ridge uh, a, a little more closely. And uh, uh, here uh, we have uh, the uh, O'Hagan Seamounts. And uh, you can see this, this very decided trend. Uh, this is a, a trend uh, that is imparted uh, by the magmatic activity uh, that intruded uh, the uh, Nazca Plate or Nazca Ocean Crust. Uh, you see that the general uh, fabric of the Nazca Ocean Crust is in, in this direction here, as shown by topography. And where uh, the ridge uh, crosses the trench, the trench axis is uh, raised by two and a half kilometers. And so this forms a dam uh, for the sediment uh, that comes from sources in the south and gives you a two and a half to three kilometer thick uh, series of uh, trench sediment. Uh, on the other side of the dam, uh, you, you get very little sediment. And actually, this is uh, a frontal prism of the erosional part of the margin. But you can see that the character of the frontal prism here in the bathymetry is quite different, showing uh, these nice uh, ridges, which are, are probably accreted sediment. But the most important part of this to the earthquake is this ridge. This is a ridge uh, that is uplifted uh, by a ridge on the plate interface where the earthquake rupture occurred. And it is from one to three kilometers high. Now, uh, let me point out that we've got a, a beautiful subducted seam out here, which is not as visible as in Costa Rica. These things don't always show up well. But we know it's there from the magnetic anomalies. There's just a big magnetic bullseye right, right around uh, this area here. And here uh, we get, uh, from geophysical evidence, uh, uh, an uplift or a raise up of, of the uh, plate interface where the rupture occurs of uh, one to three kilometers. So that could easily form uh, a barrier uh, to uh, the propagation of rupture uh, from uh, the epicenter. Now, when we go to the south, the situation is, is uh, quite different. Um, this is about five, whoops. Here we go again. Uh, this is uh, a perspective of multi-beam bathymetry uh, that is about 550 kilometers in length. And uh, your, uh, after sh uh, your, your initial epicenter is here uh, for the 2007 earthquake. Uh, and the rupture extended down to about this area right in here. And what you see on the ocean floor is this fracture zone. Now, uh, that might not look like much of a topographic feature, uh, but that feature is 20 kilometers wide, and the rims on that feature are a, a good kilometer high, and it gets buried as it goes into the, uh, the trench by the, those thick trench sediment, but it projects right up to about the area where uh, the initial rupture stopped. So uh, we're, if we're able to bracket uh, the uh, area in which uh, this rupture occurred, if we're able to see where there are barriers, uh, then we know where to instrument things uh, because those barriers can also uh, uh, lead to uh, and uh, generate uh, smaller earthquakes, uh, for one. Uh, also, uh, on this margin, what we see is a, a, a very uh, well-defined uh, frontal prism. Uh, you can see the, the change in the topography, and because this is so highly exaggerated, it's, it's difficult uh, to really make it out. But if we were to apply here the uh, original imbricate model, uh, then we would have a fault plane where the earthquakes occur uh, that is consolidated sediment on the top, 
and rough, raw, igneous ocean base, uh, uh, basement on the bottom. But the reverse is actually true. Uh, from what we know about this margin, there's a lot of seismic data that I can't present here but uh, because of time. Uh, but we know that uh, there's a beautiful subduction channel, so you've got sediment on the bottom, and you've got the base of continental crust on the top. And this is really important in terms of establishing the kinds of mineralogy that develop as you get deeper and deeper into higher pressures and uh, where fluids take over and you get uh, metamorphism uh, because uh, earthquake asperities are probably also ca uh, 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 caused by uh, the changes in, in mineralogy and patches of mineralogy. So you can see that this is a, 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 really, uh, a really very dynamic environment and uh, what uh, a, a lot of uh, geoscientists that are working in this field have now uh, come to realize and appreciate it is uh, that if you apply uh, a classical uh, Coulomb wedge, you get this bulldozer just constantly pushing uh, the dirt in front of it. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, between earthquakes, you get uh, something that is uh, where the processes are, are very slow or, or even static. And then uh, by the time uh, an earthquake comes along, all hell breaks loose. And the reason this is so important is because modeling is a, is a real powerful tool in this field. But if you're gonna model on the basis of uh, the uh, measurements that have been made in the interseismic period, which is when most of the drilling was done. I have, don't know of any drilling that was done uh, during an earthquake. Uh, then uh, you're going to get a, a whole different suite of, of frictional properties along the interface of uh, friction in the faults, of uh, actually even uh, uh, the uh, shear values in, in the sediments. Uh, so it's important to recognize uh, that the, uh, the values that we have uh, in, in this environment here uh, need to be investigated in the laboratory much more uh, rigorously uh, to show us what would happen wh when you uh, uh, create a little earthquake in the laboratory and, and uh, record what the physical property changes are. And um, what I'm gonna leave you uh, with, uh, well, I really had to put this slide in because it demonstrates uh, uh, an analogy uh, to uh, the earthquake cycle. Uh, on Victoria Island, they were able to record uh, a, a very high frequency kind of seismicity that's been called tremor. And uh, they also have uh, a GPS uh, set up which is constantly recording so that you can get the motion of the land. And uh, when you have these tremor events, uh, which where this would be uh, sort of equivalent to the interseismic period, and then you have slip, and then again, interseismic and slip and so on, at the time you get the slip, you get a real shift in the ground. And if you're moving the ground, uh, <coughs> something down there is deforming. And what it says is that deformation is, uh, the, the deformation that we see in our seismic records is probably mostly uh, created at a time of an earthquake. So uh, let me uh, leave you with a uh, dynamic model uh, to close this talk and uh, in the hopes that any of you that are writing textbooks uh, will include a dynamic model in uh, your textbooks because the older textbooks all are pretty much based on the imbricate uh, fan type model. And uh, here, uh, uh, the famous cartoonist uh, Jack Holden, who worked with Bob Dietz, has uh, made a cartoon for me. And what you have during the interseismic period is uh, just a, a slow drainage of water uh, from the frontal prism that uh, is actually fed probably from 
the, t the top of the ocean crust and uh, from the sediment that's been subducted. And uh, as these sediments are dewatered, uh, they get stiff enough to begin to accumulate elastic strain. And uh, where you might have an asperity, the, in this case just uh, uh, sort of a, like a seamount, uh, uh, that asperity will, will keep pushing the, the elastic uh, uh, strain in, in this uh, thicker volume of sediment until uh, it's too much and the uh, locked portion of the asperity breaks and then all hell breaks loose. <laughs> and uh, so I want to leave you uh, with a possible uh, new model uh, for the dynamic earthquake cycle. And thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you very much. Uh, are there questions? Anybody? Yes, go ahead. Maybe not. They were worrying at some. Yeah. Okay. Thank you again.